Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Jim St. Clair. I'm the Executive Director for Linux Foundation Public Health. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us uh, at whatever time zone that you're at for today. You know, COVID-19 has resulted in, in many changes, many new considerations for public health and healthcare delivery. Uh, but I would offer one of the areas that's been emphasized uh, a lot or unfortunately brought to the fore due to the difficult circumstances has been behavioral health and mental health. So uh, I am, uh, it uh, brings me a great deal of pleasure to be able to introduce to you Linux Foundation Public Health members, MTX, who are going to be talking about work they've done in mental health uh, and the impacts associated with it. Uh, just to spend a minute to talk about our agenda, uh, we'll be turning it over to uh, 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 Dr. A. Belisamo in a minute to discuss MTX uh, and then work our way through our esteemed panelists and discussing more of what their research around mental health and mental health data in COVID-19 uh, 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 has uh, resulted in and, and their conclusions. Have a bit of a discussion and then of course it will always be open for questions and answers which we look forward to taking. Just to provide an introduction, uh, Dr. Bat Patty Batcock is the Director of Strategic Development and Policy Initiatives uh, with Nelbo Institute and working with MTX. Uh, you also have uh, a Director of uh, Health Sciences, the MTX Group. Uh, Dora is ep epidemiologist with the MTX Group and will be providing more specifics on their research and the information that they found. And Christy Rogers, uh, AVP for Education at the MTX Group. With that, Abe, I am pleased to turn it over to you, sir, and look forward to, uh, to talking further about MTX. Sure, thank you, Jim. Really appreciate the time here. Um, just a quick overview of MTX. We are a global solutions and consulting firm with approximately 1,600 family members, and that changes daily. Um, our role here is we have a bunch of vertical leaders. We have people from public health. We have people from the education world, from research, et cetera. And we lead up a lot of the initiatives within our company. Um, we're not just a technology company, we're an outcomes company. And that's what we're really about is outcomes. As you'll see here is we've got zero failed projects with over 850 projects total. And I know that sounds crazy, but part of the reason there is we really do the investment to make sure whatever we're working on is successful. Doesn't mean there's not bumps in the road, but it does mean that we get in there and iron those out. Um, our, our scores um, from our partners, 9.7 9 out of 10, that's a satisfaction rating um, that we're very, very proud of at MTX. Um, one of the big things we're also proud of is our 1% pledge. Um, along with the 1% pledge, that's, that's a revenue number. So any money we bring in, 1% goes back to the communities that we work in and back to hardcore research, which uh, Dr. Patty Babcock and Dr. Dora Ilyosova they kind of run that side of the house. Um, and so without further ado, I would love to have Patty jump in and, and let's keep on moving. Great, thank you. Yep, go ahead, Patty. I don't, I don't move on one. Yeah, I don't, I don't have slide. Yeah, bear with me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, okay. I'm working to adjust the slides as we speak. There we go. Is that the correct one? There we go. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. And, Just uh, and, give me a shout out whenever you want to change them in case I miss. Great. Thank you so much. And, I, and thank you to everybody that's here. This is a topic that is near and dear to me. By background, I am a clinical social worker and, and have witnessed firsthand the impact of COVID on mental health. And so to kind of set the stage, you know, I'll, I'll kick off with some very high level definitions and just kind of throwing out data. My colleagues will drill down um, with regard to what's going on in the education arena, the workforce, and then some of the opioid research that, that we have done. So just for, for level setting, um, when we talk about mental health, uh, mental illness and mental well-being, to make sure that today everybody's on the same sheet of page we primarily talk about mental health and mental well-being versus mental illness. And so when we talk about mental health, what we're really talking about is that, that ability to cope with normal day-to-day -day stressors, we're able to be productive at work, uh, contribute to success, society, and, and we have a need to reach the potential that we need to reach. So by contrast, if, you know, simply if you think about the contrast of that is, is that in 
in everything that I just said about is a lot of strum and they are showing social even put the word comments up there. Uh, I mean by this, the the impact of COVID on on the place um, and how that is impacted mental health and mental well and this is not across span it specific to any one group um, we were seeing it in young children all the way to the geriatric population. You know, if we think about the young children, we know Well, it looks like we may have lost Patty for the moment. Um, Abe, uh, Dora, I know this is a little difficult on the fly, but uh, perhaps you might want to- I think I'm back. Oh, great. Yeah. Yay, she's returned. My, yeah, everything just kind of shut down, so I don't know where I left off. Apologies. Um, That's all right. It's either the blizzard in the Midwest or the storms in the South or something like that. I, I, I wish I could make that as an excuse for where I live. So I don't know where I left off. If someone could, did I start in on the children's aspect of it? I think you just started on children's before we lost you. Right. So, so when we talk about children, you know, what, what, what we knew about COVID itself, we knew that children were, were actually at low risk statistically to become ill um, with COVID. But because of the unstable learning environment, prolonged isolation, you know, the housing insecurity, parental unemployment, and other factors were really vulnerable to the same type of burden that, that adults are. Um, there's not been a whole lot of conversation about the number of parents that have died. For every four deaths, there was one of four had a child. So we have an estimated 70,000 kids across the country who do not have at least one we also saw in emergency rooms um, a pretty significant uptake specific to mental health issues. You know, right around 30% um, uptake with kids of uh, 17 and a 24% increase with kids between the ages of 5 and 11. So, so kids feeling it at a young age, um, you know, the impact of COVID. I all read um, what's going on college campuses right now, we're seeing an increase in depression, anxiety, suicide. Um, a recent study from um, uh, Best Colleges uh, of U.S. News and World Reports says 90% of college kids right now are experiencing mental health symptoms, and nearly half of those are struggling with isolation, anxiety, and a lack of focus. And so as we move across the lifespan and we think about adults, those folks that are that are in our workforce. Um, we, we now know that about four out of 10 adults have re reported symptoms of anxiety um, or depression, and they are correlating it to the pandemic, um, if you will. Also on our, our workforce, I know that Abe is gonna talk a little bit about our workforce later. I think thinking about, I mean, what are we going to do about are essential workers who were hit the hardest. Um, nearly one third of all the workforce coming in um, were uh, classified as essential workers. And we know that they are reporting higher rates of anxiety, dep depression, as well as substance misuse and alcohol misuse. And I'll let Abe talk about the front line um, and, and the risk that they now have as being um, vulnerable to at least one or more mental health problems. We're, you know, we're still in the phase, you know, that we have folks working um, remotely uh, and we're also seeing high burnout rates with them. And it makes good sense. If you think about, you know, the change in the workforce, the change in the family dynamic, you know, the closures of schools and daycares, our, our families and those that live together in the aid, 
you know, that are not families, you know, the roommate kind of situation. This is a, this is a whole new lifestyle, a whole new dance that folks need to do. Um, we've seen it, you know, we've seen it um, impact women disproportionately harder than we have men, as well as our African American community. And then the geriatric population, this is a very special population for me because I, I think, you know, at the beginning of the um, pandemic, there was there really was a, a very strong focus on our geriatric population. And as we come out of, you know, as we come out of the COVID pandemic, I think there are going to be some pretty significant impacts um, with regard to the geriatric populations. Um, they have experienced new levels of isolation from a technology standpoint. They they typically do not have the same access and or capability when it comes to social media. Um, they don't have the same community supports that they did pre-pandemic. And then within those long-term care facilities, um, we all know what happened with, with the isolation there. And then I really wanna take a few minutes to just talk about what I call the silent sufferers. And these are the folks pre-pandemic because we still are dealing with the, stu the stigma of mental health, I really want to talk about what are we going to do to address those that are those silent sufferers. You know, pre-COVID they were there, but you, you do that layer of isolation, that low visibility, that loneliness, that fear, that emotional suffering, and then you do an overlay of everybody's stressed out, everybody's burnt out. How do we help these folks continue to go and reach out for help and more importantly, are we checking in on these folks, both in the home, the schools, the community? Um, and are, are we really asking, are you okay? Um, and, and we mean it. And then lastly, substance use. Um, what we know is there has been a dramatic increase in alcohol abuse um, and substance misuse. And these are, are comorbidities with mental health issues. Um, you know, for, I don't know if most folks know this, the first week of the pandemic, we saw a 54% um, increase in alcohol purchases across the country. And so there's estimates that that, that, that has dropped, but anywhere between 14 and 33% increase um, of the frequency of alcohol consumption. And that varies by, by demographics as well. Um, but I will say that, that women are reporting the highest, um, the highest levels in terms of frequency of use and amount of use. And so if you think about what I said about the workforce and women being in, impacted by the, that remote workforce and being the, um, the essential workers, we've got to really think about what are, we, what, what, what are we going to do to help them level set and get back to a place of stability from a mental health um, standpoint. So, so lots of negativity there in terms of everything, you know, from the pandemic and all these, all these um, statistics that I'm showing, you know, I'm throwing out there. But I think it's also a great opportunity for us. Um, if I could have someone move it to the next slide, please. Sure, Patty. Happy to move it to the next slide. I mentioned real quick, I remember reading an article during the height of the pandemic talking about the transition to telehealth and how healthcare was able to pick that up. But they highlighted the percentage or just a, a general generalization of the geriatric population that use their face to face encounters with their physician as their one and only human contact that they were having to have at the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, you think ju just about that, um, you know, that that is your one and only connection with the outside world. Um, you know, and so that obviously I just presented all, all the challenges, but I, I really do think this is an opportunity. And I think, I think out of necessity, we have to rethink about the way that we deliver healthcare services. As Jim just alluded to, you know, telehealth is an accepted method now on the behavioral health side as well for both assessment and treatment. And so I think we're, we're good to go there. It's a question of what do we do with the, with the technology platforms or what can we do with those technology platforms to enhance our ability to reach a, a, a broader scope of folks, i.e. those folks in rural communities um, where they don't have the broadband access um, you know, needed to sustain the platforms. 
There's also been a, a surge in mental health downloads um, since, since COVID. There's currently, there's 600 approved mental health apps um, that are available by prescriptions. And that prescription rate has gone up. I believe I read 3,750 times um, what it was pre-COVID. So we now have doctors prescribing, prescribing tele, telehealth. Um, and folks later on in the conversation will be talking about the 988 initiative, which I think is going to be critical um, to think about how we can use technology um, throughout the, you know, throughout the life cycle of, of 988 from contact to, to discharge. But I really want to take just one minute to talk about precision health. You know, if you think about precision health from the, from the aspect of physical health, you know, I call it the, the three Bs, you know, the, the uh, biomarkers, biosensors, and then biopsies. You know, we're at a point where, where we can look, um, you know, we can, we can look at tumors and body fluids through the urine blood, and, and we can do some pretty sophisticated analysis in terms of, of, of intervention, identification, and identification. I would love to see, um, I would love to, uh, for us to think about how we can take what's currently being done in the precision health world and overlay an integration of mental health because, because we know that they are correlated. Um, and so, you know, we, if we continue to think in these silos, I don't know where we really will get with the precision health piece, but, uh, but I do think that that's the new frontier in mental health. Um, and, you know, we can, we can talk about it later, but I sure hope folks on the call are, are thinking through that are working in this field. What is the relationship to, to behavioral health um, as they're building out their solutions? So I'm going to pass it on to Christy Rogers, who is going to speak about children, mental health and wellness in education. Hi thank guys, thank, thank you for having me today. I'm proud to represent the educators across the country who have endured quite a year uh, and continue to endure quite a year. Uh, you know, the mission of education is to educate all students and, and all means all and to meet every learner where they are when by name and need when they enter a classroom or now through a screen virtually. Um, and as hard as teachers work, um, they will not be able to impact the learning experience and those necessary student outcomes without addressing mental health and wellness needs of our students. You can see the data on your screen. One in five children have diagnosed uh, emotional or behavioral or mental health disorders, and they come to school every day, and teachers have to be experts on so many things. One in 10 young people uh, have such a degree of mental health challenge that it impairs their ability to really function at, in, in the community or at home or at school. And, you know, I just want to share with the audience a little bit what you might see in a classroom. These, these behaviors manifest themselves inside of every classroom from kindergarten all the way through high school on it to a college campus. And it's such a wide range. Uh, you know, teachers may see, you may be suffering in silence a little bit and just show hyperactivity or disorganization or difficulty focusing on a lesson. Uh, you might be see a student that's very, very quiet or disengaged with work and it with the work in the classroom, but it, it also stems all the way to a range of aggressive behavior and bullying uh, that we see so often. So, you know, we ask a lot of our educators and it's very difficult for classroom teachers to identify and support every one of these students in real time uh, and with expert strategies to help them face, you know, to help them support and move forward in, in, in their uh, education. So often these behaviors have such a lot large range and um, regardless of how good teachers are and how hard they work, oftentimes these undiagnosed, untreated mental health conditions in these ranges ultimately end up in some type of discipline infraction or uh, they appear to be behind academically, like they're not capable of learning, which we know is not true, but Ultimately, it, it really manifests into loss of learning time, which is then a dangerous cycle, right? Uh, when a student lose, loses learning time because of these mental health conditions or just wellness and well-being in general, the anxiety from the COVID pandemic, that we fall into a pretty dangerous cycle of learning loss. And then those outcomes that we started with in the conversation are not capable. We're not, we're, we, the gaps begin to widen. Um, go to the next slide, um, please. 
you know, in order for us to accomplish and intervene um, in the mission to educate everyone, you know, schools have to play a larger role in mental health. Before we had one siloed lane of we're there to educate kiddos, right? But that's not the case anymore. And we are taking on a larger role. We're seeing school districts across the country um, play a bigger role in social and emotional needs. And as a result of the pandemic, schools are redefining their systems of support. Uh, what does that look like? But there's a a big need to modernize those systems of support. And we know that modernizing a school needs to really consider identification and integration with all the community agencies that you heard Patty talk about and you'll hear the rest of the panelists talk about. But, you know, research tells us the earlier that we um, address mental health, the outcomes tend to be better uh, for the person suffering. But we know that schools may be the very first time that a student may get services for mental health and well-being. And for, unfortunately for so many, it may be the only opportunity in that K through 20 cycle to get any uh, extra support. So I applaud the schools. They've taken you know, a lot of, it's been just a tough time and, and they, are, they don't always get the credit they deserve for, for supporting so many, but I applaud the school districts for making an investment. I've seen lots of my peers that are still working uh, place mental health uh, practitioners um, in the schools. But the next step is to give those mental health practitioners and those counselors that are usually working one to 400 more modernized tools for data science and data management so they can uh, help with those wraparound services. We've talked about those for years, wraparound services or cradle to career services. But without some efficient uh, modernized tools, it's just nearly impossible to effectively and efficiently meet the needs of the students that have so much overwhelming needs. I just wanna to touch on some things. So if you're listening out there and you're an educator to check into, but right now we have technology that could help us check early and often the sense of belonging for a student. You know, we know that that's a key indicator to the health and stability for students. It just, if I belong in this school, then I'm less likely to, um, drop out or to fall behind. We know there's technology schools that can allow communication in a much more private way uh, where we can send information to folks who need. If I'm being bullied, I need an efficient way to communicate with my mental health practitioner or a school counselor and to communicate and inform and ask for help on topics. There's chat boxes and electronic schedulers that would allow families to make appointments. We should break down barriers and use the tools that are out there on the market, and especially through MTX to help. You know, there's lots of places out there to help. Uh, and we also need to educate our students and giving them uh, giving them all, their own learning to understand how to uh, handle and manage many of their uh, symptoms. But learning management systems can help train teachers and educators on um, mindfulness techniques and for mental, for mental health first aid. And we can build uh, lots of systems. And then you're going to hear so much more about this new 988 system where we can um, really help a student in their most severe time with services that they need. And guys, we need to know that kids go to school and this is the one place that we might could do the best for kiddos and families. Untreated mental illness stemming a lot from the pandemic and even before the pandemic leads to high dropout rates, unemployment and substance abuse and incarceration and even early death in the suicide rates of our young people. So educators, if you're listening you know, we're here to help you modernize and build a comprehensive mental health solution uh, and let the technology help drive that. You can only do so much. And if we're using paper and pencil to try to manage and wrap around these kids who need us so much, it's going to be very difficult to operate efficiently and effectively. So thank you for the voice of all the educators and all the work that you do out there. It's, it's besides teaching curriculum. You have to stabilize that child so they can learn. And we know that that's very important. Um, I'll hand it off to um, a Balsamo for some more information. Thank you all. Thanks, Christy, and thanks, Patty. Love your perspective. Um, my perspective comes from a different angle. Um, I've worked in the hospitals, in emergency departments, and I continue to work in corrections also. So that's the point of reference that I have. Um, you know, I don't want to go through all these. Everybody can see all the stats here, but I want to talk to a few of them. Um, burnout is real. We know that. We've seen it across the country in all professions, but it, as Patty and Christy both touched on, it is affecting medical providers and nurses and the whole medical community. And that includes everybody from the people you meet at the front door 
the people cleaning up, the people running the hospitals, et cetera. This includes the whole system. The system is overworked um, in some cases and in a lot of cases underpaid, especially our techs and the people doing the real work on, on the ground that sometimes get missed in this conversation. They're getting burnt out. They're you know the $15 an hour type of workers who didn't sign up for a pandemic. They didn't sign up for the disease that they could potentially contract. And even if they don't get it, there's always that anxiety because you're in a place where it's all over the place. Um, you just are wondering when the next, when the shoe's gonna drop it, as it were. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, I left the workforce. I'm one of the one in five who left the workforce um, mostly. I still keep a toe in there in, in corrections, but I felt that pain. I was running a COVID unit. Um, it's rough. It takes it out of you. You go home, you're worried about bringing it to your kids who may or may not be vaccinated. You worry about a lot of other things that aren't necessarily you. You know, as, as men, I live in New Mexico, we have this machismo, it can't get me. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm not worried about my family. It doesn't mean I'm not worried about my friends. It doesn't mean I'm not worried about everybody around me. And to that point, that machismo that happens, and mostly in men, I will say, um, it is where the silent sufferers also are. We see this around the world. We touched on that a little bit, but Robin Williams, for example, looked like the happiest guy in the world. He took his own life. Um, I've had two co-workers in the last two years who have taken their own lives. These are educated doctors running emergency departments, and nobody knew because we didn't ask. Nobody knew they were sick. Nobody knew they were feeling bad. Nobody knew they were under these pressures at least, and, and nobody asked. And so that was a big deal for me personally. And a reason why I said, I got to take care of myself. Um, you know, nobody is asking the right questions. And we have so many ways to ask the right questions by leaning on technology, et cetera. You'll see here that we have shortages like crazy. And those shortages in nursing, in doctors, in PAs, nurse practitioners, et cetera, those shortages only strain the system more. They strain the people more. They're working overtime. They're doing 60 hours instead of 40 hours. All of these things start to build up. And two years down the road, we're losing our workforce. Um, this is a huge issue. The entry to the workforce is really, really hard. You got to go through a lot of school. You got to learn a lot. And to lose 20% of them almost overnight strains the system. And we hear things about, well, you're paying nurses too much. Well, that's a supply and demand issue, and it's in direct result to this COVID um, situation that we've gotten into with anxiety and all the other pieces that go with it. Um, so there is that for sure. We're also seeing that in physicians specifically, 40% more likely to commit suicide than the general population. That number is huge. Again, you're losing the people that are supposed to be taking care of you. Um, female physicians tend not to have the same rate as male physicians at that age group. So we're talking the age group 30 and above. Generally, the quote unquote Caucasian male has a much higher risk of suicide, but not in the health world. In the health world, men and women are equal uh, to that uh, metric, if you will. Um, even in hiring and HR, suicide is now being considered an occupational hazard such almost in the same narrow-minded view as getting poked by a needle. Well, that's an occupational hazard. You just had to take it. That's not fair. That's not a fair expectation. Um, a lot of the things that go with that, anxiety, depression, mood disorders, addiction, um, multiple layers of addiction, and especially opiate addiction. We're seeing in hospitals, we're seeing in the correctional facilities, opiates have gone rampant. And it's one of those things that really we we knew it was a pandemic before the pandemic, and it's only gotten worse because everybody's eyes shifted to the left. They're looking at the disease of COVID rather than all the other things that go with it. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Yeah, happy to move to the next slide, Abe. And I I just add as a personal note too, um, we have a family physician that we know very well. See so several members of the family who literally had to bolt from an appointment to try and track down a friend of his who was also another physician. Wife hadn't heard from him. Nobody knew where he was. He wasn't answering his phone and was gone for two days. I talked to him later on and he said he found him and he was safe, but he said burnout is real. Right. No, 100% agree. Burnout is definitely real. And, and there's ways that we can combat it just as a group. 
from a technology standpoint, we can do better staffing. There's no reason we need to be understaffed everywhere. We can figure out um, how to staff sit, uh, at the right time, basically. Make sure that everybody has coverage. Make sure we're not being overworked, number one. And that can be driven by real data using AI, machine learning, et cetera. Um, I think a big piece also is at least where I work, and I'm not going to pigeonhole everybody, but where I work, our leaders, our CEO types, our business leaders, they don't understand. They, they don't understand that real pull, that danger that we have, and they're not asking the right questions. If I logged in, if I can log in electronically to do my time card, well, then I can log in in the same place at the same time and tell the bosses, hey, I'm not feeling good. Hey, I'm feeling anxiety. I would like some kind of support. That should be built into our systems. These are things that we're doing in education now. We should be doing in hospitals because the honest truth is we all are logging into these systems. And if they're not being utilized the way they can, we're missing a huge piece. And we could see at, with sentiment, sentiment analysis, et cetera, we could predict better who's going to leave the workforce and who, if we gave them a little support, wouldn't leave the workforce. Um, these type of things could be very easily fixed from my perspective uh, with a little bit of technology built in. Um, I know, Christy, you talked on a little bit of 988, and that's close to my heart. It's dear to me. I'm working on some big initiatives there. 988 is basically 911 for mental health emergencies. We expect that 30% of 911 calls will be diverted uh, within the next year or two. This is a huge amount of work. It's going on in the background. And if we get it right, this will serve our full, everybody. This is going to serve everybody, the whole country, in a very very, very great way. We send the right people to the right place at the right time to give support. You're not leading with guns. You're leading with people who are trained in mental health emergencies. And I think that's extremely important. Um, we're trained in de-escalation rather than escalating a situation potentially. We know that uh, 16 times um, the, the suicide by police, I will say, it's more likely 16 times with mental health patients than it is with the general population uh, for lots of different reasons. But one of those reasons is we're sending the wrong people. They're not trained for this. And 988 is going to help that as long as we get the technology right. So that's something we're, we're really happy to help with and we want to see succeed generally. Um, the other piece that I think we should be doing is determining who should be getting uh, little perks you know, there's lots of COVID money, there's lots of other things, but to get the people the perks they need to keep them in the workforce, I think is very important. Rather than pulling resources, we should be giving resources. We should be getting people mental health. We should be able to teach them how to do self-help, these type of things. And that should be on the employer from my perspective. If it's not on the employer, then it should be on the government. But the individuals who are in crisis are not necessarily going to reach out all by themselves. So we need to put some things in front of them, which we can certainly do with technology. Um, with that, I'm going to hand off to Dora, Dr. Ilyoseva. She's an epidemiologist for MTX, and she's been working on this opiate crisis in relation to COVID. And so I'd like to hand it over to Dora now. Hello. Um, uh, hello. Uh, I hope you see the slide. And um, my story is uh, a story about opioid crisis during the pandemic. There were lots of articles predicting this perfect storm that we already are in opioid crisis and during the pandemic, it can be exacerbated. So we decided to look at the data that were available to see whether we can tell the story of how opioid crisis could be affected by pandemic. Um, what you see here are several graphs, and these are from, the, from our recent publication in Drug and Alcohol Dependence. On the left, you see two panels, A and B, and on the right, you see also two panels. Um, and I will explain to you what are this data. On panel A, the purple are EMS runs, uh, total EMS runs for the country during the years 2018, 2019, and 2020. 
And then you see below that uh, blue lines, and these are opioid-related runs. So that, what, that is the background for the data that we used. So if you look at 2018 and 2019, um, nothing, they look similar, nothing really happened. You, you don't see much of what, what is different between these two years. But if you look at 2020, you will see that um, in the middle of March and uh, through the spring and to the summer, you see a huge drop in total uh, EMS runs. And if you look at, uh, at opioid related runs, uh, you will see completely different trend. It increases exactly at the same time. And then in pa panel B, you see expanded uh, part for the opioid runs uh, for 2020. And I invite you to compare this to uh, opioid related runs on the two panels on the left, 2019 and 2020 and 2018. To, uh, both of pre-COVID years, what they show you that there is increase uh, through the spring and then peak of opioid related runs in August and then it goes down. Uh, but if you look at the COVID year, you see that uh, first of all, there is acceleration, there is a, uh, the trend is much uh, higher in the, in the spring and then the peak in June and then it goes down. I also want you to notice two shaded areas in this expansion, uh, the green and the yellow. The green is before is the period before stay at home order started. And yellow is the period during which stay at home order were, um, went into effect. And then in, Ju in June, it, uh, stopped, uh, basically they were released. So you could see this uh, periods uh, marked in every year. Uh, so, and then you see um, red lines, vertical lines that show statistically different uh, difference in trend. This statistical difference in trend can show both uh, the upward or downward. Let's look at 2018, and you don't see any increase during the period um, between at, at uh, stay at home. So the period that corresponds to stay at home period. So um, you see three lines, but they show that the upward trend actually uh, decelerated, went down during the spring, and then you don't see any red lines into uh, during the same period in 2019. But in 2020, you see that uh, increase, the first red line is just before the stay at home period started. That's when the pandemic uh, went on. And then you see increase one after another uh, in, in the rate of opioid related runs. So basically we see two different patterns in the data that on the naked eye look like noise. You can't really see anything with the naked eye. You can only see this difference with the analysis. Uh, could you please uh, turn another slide? Okay, so you can ask me, so what? We, I want to make sure that the, all this analysis doesn't make sense if you don't have an actionable point. What I want to show, what I wanted you to take, uh, uh, like a take home message is that we can monitor basically a hidden phenomenon on non-fatal opioid overdose. Right now, all the public health measures 
are uh, taken in response to opioid death. And the release of this data has a huge lag compared to the AMS runs, which can be streamlined and you can detect the change in this uh, trends very, very in a very, very sensitive system. So if you have this warning system, you can proactively use uh, public health measures, harm reduction measures, or whatever we have, whatever tools we have in our public health and community uh, services. Uh, there is another side to this. If we have started new programs, then we can use the same system to tell us whether this program works or doesn't work. So altogether, there, there is a system that can be employed to show us uh, with high sensitivity what uh, we should anticipate and how we should react uh, in terms of um, opioid overdose. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dora. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Abe. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, great rundown, great discussion topics, and obviously very timely and very pertinent. Um, we now open it up for questions and answers to our panelists. You have a, a Q&A button there on your Zoom webinar. Feel free to, uh, to pop questions in there, and I'll be watching to share with the panelists. While those questions get promulgated, I had a couple that I just wanted to run through. One I would open up for, for the panelists for further discussion, or maybe to you specifically, Abe, around 988. I just want to explore that for a little while, just in terms of you know, better understanding it myself and roll out. Uh, will there be a new 988 system comparable to 911? Would you call 911 with a mental health emergency and get redirected to 988? Uh, how do you envision that system working? So this is a mandate coming from 2020 uh, from the president's desk. This was basically a way, we all knew it was a problem. We all knew it was coming and it's gone through legislature at the federal level and now into the state levels. Um, the funding is there. We're looking at about four and a half billion dollars worth of funding total. Um, to answer your question, it's gonna be a parallel system. You will not call 911, you're gonna call 988 if you have a mental health emergency. The word has to get out. So there's going to be a big marketing push. There's going to be TV ads. There's going to be a lot of things going on to get the word out. If, you, if you're feeling suicidal or you need some help, you need some mental health, uh, mental health support, call 988 and we'll get you in touch. And behind the scenes, you'll have a very similar system to 911 in that they will have a dispatch system. They'll have a case management system. There's linkage to open beds and things like that. And I think in my mind, and I touched on this, the most important thing is if you are truly in an emergency, you're standing on the edge of the cliff and about to do whatever you, you're, you've been thinking about doing, you will get dispatch of the right people at the right time, rather than, you know, 911 is a catch-all. If you call 911, here they come and they're bringing everybody. Um, and in a mental health emergency, that's not always the best way to do this. And so that's a big differentiator with 988. And I think we'll save a lot of lives and ultimately save a lot of money. We're losing a lot of people from the workforce. We're losing a lot of people just in productive hours as far as society goes. Um, and this is a big way and a big push all the way from the top through state government, all the way to the counties and cities to get people the right care at the right time. That's great, and and certainly moving in the right direction. Uh, one question to explore, of course, is in the 911 example, it goes hand in hand with established EMS. There's always fire departments and ambulances and and police departments that respond. They can coordinate response to, amongst each other. So if an ambulance can't make it, they'll send a fire truck that has a paramedic on board. But of course, this kind of comes down to the nature and type of mental health resources available. Do you, do you see any real disparities or fluctuations in this case-by-case -case implementation because of just the variation of availability in any one location? Yeah, it's going to be, so part of this model is a, a crisis response team that will be on call in a local jurisdiction at all times, you know, and it's obviously not going to be exactly the same people all the time, but it'll be the right people 
uh, to respond in real time. And so one of the spokes on the wheel certainly is 911 and the traditional response. You know, here comes the, the police and the ambulance and fire and whoever needs to be there. That's one of the spokes on the wheel, but that's more of a as needed response instead of an automatic response. Um, these uh, lifeline centers typically will get the call from 988 when you when you dial 988. The lifeline centers are suicide centers. There's 180 of them throughout the country. They're very well trained. They're led by PhDs and MDs. They have uh, master's level mental health providers and, and bachelor's level people with extra training. Um, that's not a typical call center. This is a call center built for mental health specifically. And when they dispatch, the average is around three to 4% nationwide. Um, the rest of the calls won't be dispatched. And so again, we're saving money to the system in general because you're not getting a 90% dispatch rate. You're getting a three to 4% dispatch rate. And again, you're, you're gonna be dispatching the right people. Um, again, I'm gonna keep touching on that. The right people at the right time is very, very important. 911 historically for a mental health emergency, 72 hours is a typical response. Um, that's, that's too long if I'm standing on the cliff in my mind. Yeah, great point. Um, Patty, I have a question I want to direct to you for a moment. So going back to your discussion on precision medicine, you know, just based on my own uh, family experience with cancer, we talk about the genome, the biome, and the exome. And of course, genome was your genetic and epigenetic makeup. Biome is what your body is exposed to that you consume and, and, and things that are put in it. Um, and, and exome is the environment you live in. Do you see those sorts of models maybe coming together around behavioral health and ways that pre precision medicine could inject into that? Um, with, you know, obviously work stressors being an exome type factor and genome being a certain genetic predisposition for, for depression or something like that? I, I certainly hope that we will get to that point be, because we know, like I said earlier, we, we know the cyclical interaction between behavioral health and whether it's substance abuse, mental health and physical health. And so I, I think we really have to start thinking about it as we're looking you know, if you're going to use those three areas, how, what should we be looking at partitioning off, thinking about that will address the, the behavioral health side as well? Great. And a follow up question for you and actually for, for Christy as well. You know, obviously in our prior lives, we had worked together in, in Florida and Florida at the time was rolling out a concept of uh, behavioral health kiosks in schools to allow for direct intervention with students who could step aside, go to a private kiosk, uh, have, a, have a telehealth intervention or, or mental health discussion. Um, Christy and, and Patty, are you seeing that trend or any other projects like that going on in other states or other school systems that might be considering it? I do, I do not know of other school systems outside of Florida. But it's been very interesting. Um, you know, I, I know Florida, in addition to other states, um, because of COVID and because of some of the, the additional federal funds that are being pushed down, schools are, schools are putting social workers, clinicians in the school. Um, and there are requirements to, you know, to treat these, these students. So I, I, am, a, I am assuming um, that, that we will go that way. And I'm also assuming looping it back to 988, um, looping back to 988, the possibility of using home base, school based kiosks and the 988 um, rollout as well. You know, I, I've not seen a lot of that. That's a very innovative and bold move of, for the state of Florida. But, you know, the public school system, not a lot of funds have been allocated for mental health areas. You know, they're there with primary mission is to educate teachers uh, and things needed to move the academic progression of a student. But we're, we're with the influx of uh, money from the federal government, from the pandemic, we hope to see and give, give administrators and school districts um, the ability to do some innovation, right? To, to address this and to see that this is a major barrier to meeting their mission and outcomes, which is educating all students. And this is not just a K through 12, but these are our college campuses. As these young adults move in, the pressures of college, um, final exams and all of the experiences, and we wanna retain those students, keep them in, integrated. We're gonna have to power that technology up and, and really develop a comprehensive system of support. It will not be this, it'll be the 988, it'll be technology, it'll be dashboarding, it'll be lots of things, telehealth, 
that we can as a comprehensive scope of view. And that's what we are seeing, especially on college campuses and K through 12 systems where districts are looking at a comprehensive approach to mental health and how we can wrap around services and communicate. We've always had early warning signals if you're tru truancy behaviors and grades, we can look at those things on a student and predict your ability to graduate. We need to start really diving into the data to, to determine those mental health and wellness, social emotional learning indicators so we can get you support by name and by need. A lot of work to be done in the education area. Yeah, that's great, Christy. And, and just wondering, since you specifically commented on districts, are you seeing these sorts of initiatives being a district by district implementation with, uh, with the outside federal funding? Or are you seeing more state departments of education take on things uh, like those factors you considered in order to promulgate to all districts, you know, a game plan, a response pattern, additional resources, et cetera. You know, I'm from Kentucky and right now it's really seems left up to the, each school district, a large urban district and, and where I worked for a while may need something totally different from a rural district. And, and I think the state of Kentucky particularly has, is really uh, from the, they are there to provide support and guidance, but they want the school districts to develop systems that support the students they serve, right? It's going to almost have to be custom built by the communities and the services available to those students and the leadership of that district, because everybody needs a little different. It's a, such a wide range from a, a small rural district to a large urban district. Uh, and, and think that, think about all the different makeups of the of communities across the country. So uh, we're seeing right now, it's really up to the school, school board and school system to become educated and to, to really expand and, and put funds towards that to, to address it. Yeah, great. Uh, one last question for you, Dora, and, and I'm not sure whether or not your data necessarily analyzed this, but what kind of piqued my interest as I thought through it is in terms of some of the, the opioid crisis misuse information statistics you were gathering, um, did you notice certain trends with regards to geography, whether things were happening more in the east, the west, the south? Uh, and, and I guess as a bonus question, was there any overlay to states that had um, uh, more progressively adopted medical marijuana or recreational marijuana use relative to opioid misuse statistics? Oh, well, thank you for this question because I had this question myself. <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately, the data that we use does not allow us to know what, are, what is the state. Uh, it's uh, because of confidentiality. It, it's an IRB that does not allow us to see the state. Right. Uh, but I, uh, I reached out to different states after we saw this pattern. I was like, oh, that would be interesting to see what happens in different areas. And uh, even with the seasonal national trend, you can see that uh, it's completely counterintuitive that opioid overdose increases during the summer, as you think like, oh no, this is not such a depressing period. It should right. we, should, we should see it in the winter. I wanted to reach to the states to see like Alaska has more winter or Florida has more summer or, you know, to see the difference. And the states were not very responsive to that. So. I would love to answer this question uh, if I had more data. Yeah, because if you can survive February in Minnesota, you can survive anything, right? I mean, right, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is a very interesting phenomenon, and I do believe that there are geographic differences. I want to say something also, like uh, we didn't publish this data, but we also looked at the sex age subgroups. And uh, I will let you guess which subgroups, which age subgroups showed higher acceleration in the spring of 2020. Hmm, I'd have to say older male subgroups perhaps? Um, male, Yes, but what would be what would you expect in ages? We started at ages above ten, and all the ages above. What would what would you expect to see? Well, as a guy in his fifties, I'll pick on the fifties age group and say that. Well, no, the youngest were uh, the highest were among youngest uh, groups, like from thirty actually to 50, 
And then, uh, so the pandemic affected, in, you know, through this lens of opioid crisis, but affected this group more than uh, older groups. I wonder if that ties, and I'm, you know, philosophically spitballing here, but if you relate the pandemic to economic disruption and that being kind of the period of your life that you're in highest wage earning areas, greatest sensitivity to wage fluctuation, if that group perhaps was subject to the greatest economic pressures and that also translated to opioid uh, abuse. Yeah, that, that, was, that was my thought. Um, and uh, that's why I'm saying that uh, this data, if we, if states or other systems will sign up uh, and uh, look at the data or will, um, you know, th then we can have sort of like a magnifying glass to see what happens in different groups because not all groups respond the same way to the same situation. And uh, what we see the, uh, nationally, the pattern of increase during the spring and the summer may be absolutely flat for uh, young people. Maybe it is that where we will see the increase in uh, older people. I mean, I don't know, but um, there are some, I, I started looking at some biological literature and one of the interesting ideas is that the opioid mu receptors are more valuable in the brain when the length of the daylight is higher. So there are lots of biological reasons or sociobiological reasons or other reasons why we see different patterns uh, but without seeing these patterns and knowing when they are happening, where and with whom, we can't address that. It's kind of tantalizing because at one point you don't know what you don't know, and now you clearly know what you don't know, and that makes you know kind of the corresponding answer that much more frustrating to be able to get to. So, yeah, fantastic. Uh, this has been a tremendous panel. It doesn't appear I have any more questions coming in, which uh, is just fine. We're close to the top of the hour. I'd like to thank A, Christy, Dora, Patty uh, for your participation today. Certainly, I found it very informative and greatly appreciate your support. For everyone else here, make sure you tune into our YouTube channel if you uh, want to see a repeat or share that uh, with colleagues of yours that may be interested. And as always, you can go to www.lfph.io to find more information on Linux Foundation Public Health. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening wherever you are and look forward to seeing you again shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.